Welcome back to part two of what is sort of a two-part, but also a completely separate series on the German tank destroyers of World War II. In the last video, I talk about Panzerjäger, from the Panzerjäger I in 1940, all the way up to the Nassorn in 1943, so you can go watch that if you haven't already. In that video, I discussed the Martyr vehicles, which were hastily developed in 1941 and 1942 to try and address the threat of the Soviet T-34 and KV-1 by putting a large 7.5cm Pac-40 into an obsolete tank chassis. But the Martyrs weren't the only vehicles to receive this treatment. Another iconic vehicle would receive the 7.5cm gun, the Sturmgeschütz, or as you may know it, the Stug. The Stug, despite not being a tank destroyer itself, was likely the inspiration for every vehicle I'll talk about in this video. Originally designed as an assault gun, as per the name Sturmgeschütz, the Stug was an attempt to mount the 7.5cm KWK-37 howitzer on a modified Panzer III hull, for use against fortifications and as an infantry support weapon. The Panzer III was stripped back to its hull and built back up again without a turret. Instead, the 7.5cm howitzer was mounted in a casemate, an armoured enclosed superstructure where the turret would have been. Compared to a turreted design on the same chassis, a casemate has a lot more interior volume, is cheaper, lighter, has a lower profile and is mechanically simpler, which means a larger gun can be mounted and more armour can be added. The downside is that the gun can only be aimed in a relatively small arc, and the vehicle is therefore very vulnerable to anything not directly in front of it. The Stug was first put into action in 1940 as an infantry support piece. By the end of the war, it had become the most prolific armoured vehicle in the Wehrmacht's arsenal, with over 10,000 produced and over 20,000 claimed vehicle kills. Over the five years of the war, the Stug series had seen numerous upgrades, including the long 7.5cm Pac-40, and really shone in the defensive operations of 1943 to 1945, where the lack of a turret wasn't such a hindrance. All in all, it was a huge success, but German engineers thought they could do better. And as per usual with Nazi Germany, better almost certainly meant bigger. So let's dive in to the Jagdpanzers. I'm going to be going through these vehicles chronologically, and when I first started doing the research for this video, I was really surprised at the order that these vehicles were produced. Unless you had the list in front of you, I think you'd also struggle. So, the first dedicated Jagdpanzer, the Ferdinand. The Ferdinand actually started life as a Tiger, or to be more specific, a Porsche Tiger. The production Tiger tanks were designed by Henschel, but there originally was another competing design by Porsche. Porsche was so confident that their design would be chosen for production that they built 100 hulls before the decision had even been made. When German command chose Henschel's design for the Tiger project, Porsche was left with 100 near useless heavy tank hulls. These hulls were chosen for a new project, a Jagdpanzer, or hunting tank. A heavily armoured superstructure would be added to the vehicles, along with an 8.8cm Pac-43 that was already mounted on the Nassorn. The idea was that the Ferdinand, named after Ferdinand Porsche himself, would be much more capable of offensive actions than the lightly armoured Nassorn or Martyr vehicles, being able to destroy T-34s and KV-1s at ranges of over 3 kilometers, while remaining immune to return fire due to its thick armour. Like Panther and Nassorn, Ferdinand saw its combat debut at the Battle of Kursk. The 8.8cm gun performed excellently, and the armour of the Ferdinand proved formidable. However, the commander didn't even have his own capola, and 33 Ferdinands were lost to mines in just the first day of the battle, as they accidentally stumbled into Soviet minefields. The vehicle also suffered hugely from reliability issues. The complicated suspension and electric drive caused issues on the Tiger P, but now the Ferdinand weighed 60 tonnes, these issues had only gotten worse. The weight of the vehicle also meant that they were incredibly hard to recover, with five Burge Panzer IVs required to work in tandem to haul a disabled Ferdinand back to German lines. And just to top it off, the vehicle had no way of defending itself from infantry attack, with crews resorting to firing their own weapons through the tank's main gun barrel to try and fend off the Molotov and anti-tank grenade wielding Soviet troops. After Kursk they fought on, and in late 1943 the surviving vehicles, around 45 of them, returned to Germany for major repairs and overhaul. This included wider tracks, the commander finally getting a cupola, a gun shield being added to the main gun, the driver's armour being improved, 
and the radio operator becoming a machine gunner, with an MG34 ball mount being added to the front hull. Around this time, the decision was made to rename Ferdinand to Elephant, but this name change had nothing to do with the overhaul as some people think, and was actually a completely separate issue. Ferdinands did not become Elephants once they received the upgrade, or anything like that. The Elephant would see combat in Italy in 1944, and would fight on in the East until mid-1945. Due to a lack of spare parts or replacement vehicles, only four Elephants would survive long enough to fight in Berlin, where the last vehicle was finally destroyed by the Soviets in the last days of the war. The Elephant certainly had some serious flaws, but the vehicle is credited with the highest kill-death ratio of any vehicle in World War II, with some sources stating this is as high as 10 vehicles destroyed for each Elephant lost. Two vehicles survive, one in America and one in Russia. It was a rocky start for the Jagdpanzers, but there was definitely potential there. Thankfully, the next vehicle is somewhat more sensible, the Jagdpanzer IV. With the huge success of the Stug III in the anti-tank role, it was decided to build a new, purpose-built tank destroyer based on the Panzer IV chassis. The new vehicle would mount the 7.5cm Pac-39 gun, similar to that mounted on the Panzer IV or Stug, but would enjoy much better armour protection with 60mm of sloped armour at 60 degrees on the front of the vehicle, and 30mm of armour sloped at 30 degrees on the sides. The Jagdpanzer IV was much simpler to produce than the turreted Panzer IV it was developed from. It had better armour and the same firepower, with the only drawback being the fact that it lacked a turret, and was therefore weak in offensive operations. However, at this point in the war, in late 1943, there would be very little offensive operations left, with Germany being firmly on the back foot. And in this role, the Jagdpanzer was an incredibly effective weapon. Despite the Jagdpanzer IV being a slightly superior vehicle, many question why Germany didn't simply build more Stug 3s. This is because the Jagdpanzer IV was initially designed around the 7.5cm KWK-42, the same gun mounted on the Panther. Around half of the 2000 production Jagdpanzer IVs would end up mounting this weapon, which, despite being a formidable anti-tank gun, meant that the vehicle was now front heavy and a lot less manoeuvrable. One factory, when transitioning from Panzer IV production to Jagdpanzer IV production, was ordered to create an interim solution, mounting the Pac-42 L70 gun onto the slightly different chassis of the unmodified Panzer IV. This vehicle, very much the ugly duckling of the family, will be known as the Panzer IV 70A, and around 250 will be built before the plant fully transitioned to Jagdpanzer IV production. The 2000 Jagdpanzer IVs would fight until the end of the war, with a few surviving in France, Germany, Switzerland, and interestingly, Syria. This is because Syria actually operated five Jagdpanzer IVs until 1967, with one being destroyed by Israel in the Six Day War. These were still listed in Syrian army inventory until 1991, and nobody really knows what happened to them. The Jagdpanzer IV was a cheap, capable vehicle built on a slightly dated chassis but it only had a 75mm gun. Seeing the success of the 8.8cm armed elephants and Nassorn vehicles against even the newest Soviet heavy tanks, Germany decided that the new Jagdpanzer would mount the 8.8cm. Third time's the charm, as they say. The new vehicle wouldn't be completely new, it would be an existing, modern hull. That of the Panther. This is the Jagdpanther, one of the most fearsome and iconic vehicles of World War II. The Jagdpanther would follow the same design philosophy as the Jagdpanzer, keep the hull of the medium tank it was based on, and delete the turret. The Panther's 80mm of frontal armour was simply extended upwards to form the basis of the casemate, while the side armour was thickened slightly to account for the small decrease in angle. This was done to ensure the crew had enough space inside the casemate to manoeuvre the 88mm rounds into the massive Pac-43 gun, which is mounted in the centre of the casemate behind a rather large gun mantlet. The Jagdpanther was lucky enough to be based on the Panther G hull, so it avoided the horrific mechanical issues that had been seen on the earlier Panther D and Panther A. This meant that the vehicle was well armoured, relatively mobile for a 45 ton tank, and had a very capable main gun. The tank was first deployed in March 1944, first seeing combat in July. In its first engagement, three Jagdpanthers were reported to have destroyed up to 11 Churchill tanks of the 6th Guards Tank Brigade in Normandy. The vehicle would serve well on both the western and eastern fronts, well liked by its crews and feared by its foes. The big issue was that Germany just didn't have enough of them, or rather, couldn't produce them anymore. The situation at this point in Germany was dire, with constant Allied bombing significantly slowing any manufacturing that could have gone on. 
Even still, Germany was rapidly running out of supplies and skilled labour. And the fact that the Jagdpanther was competing with Panther G production lines for materials and spare parts didn't help things. Building a casemate tank destroyer on an obsolete chassis was one thing, as you're turning something useless into something useful. But trying to build one on the chassis of one of your most important and capable battle tanks at the time? Slightly less efficient. And as a result of these issues, only 413 Jagdpanthers were produced by the end of the war. Naturally, the Germans learned from this mistake and didn't make any more casemate tank destroyers from hulls that were still in production. Just kidding, of course they did. This is World War II Germany we're talking about after all. See, there was a plan to mount a 128mm gun in the Jagdpanther, but this was deemed impossible. Instead, it was decided to mount the 128mm gun on the chassis of the Tiger II to create the Jagdtiger. The Jagdtiger was essentially the Jagdpanther on crack and took the concept to its extremes. It mounted the 12.8cm Pack 44 gun on a lengthened Tiger II hull, with a boxy superstructure in place of the turret, very similar to that seen on the Ferdinand. Like the Ferdinand, the armour was incredibly thick, with 250mm of steel at the front of the casemate and 150mm on the angled front glacis plate. Having this much armour essentially made the vehicle immune from the front, but it had its drawbacks, namely the weight. The Jagdtiger was the heaviest combat vehicle used by any nation in World War II at over 70 metric tons. The vehicle was equipped with the same engine that had struggled to power the Tiger I, which had just weighed over 50 tons. This engine was being pushed to its limits in the Tiger II, but in the Jagdtiger was just too much. The limited 10 degrees of gun traverse meant that the entire vehicle was forced to rotate to aim the main gun, which put immense strain on the engine and led to the vehicle having absolutely abysmal reliability. The 128mm gun, while impressive, was overkill for pretty much any target the Jagdtiger could possibly face, but it did mean the vehicle could engage from incredible ranges, with kills reported up to 4km away by some units. Only around 80 vehicles were ever produced, running into the same issues as Jagdpanther. The majority of these were destroyed by their own crews after their vehicles broke down or became immobilised. The Mammoth vehicle was a sitting duck for Allied aircraft, and when damaged it was almost impossible to recover or repair. Yes, they had mounted a 12.8cm gun in a tank destroyer, but really, what was the point? In a shock twist, the next and last Jagdpanzer was actually a sensible, efficient design. Based on the modified chassis of the Panzer 38T, the Jagdpanzer 38T took all the strengths of the previous Jagdpanzers and avoided almost all of their weaknesses. It mounted the same 7.5cm gun of the Jagdpanzer IV in a much smaller vehicle, with 60mm of frontal armour sloped at 60 degrees giving it more frontal protection than even the Tiger. The vehicle was likely based off the Romanian Marisal tank destroyer, which does have very similar characteristics and was assessed at length by German engineers. This new vehicle had over 29 different names throughout its short career, but nowadays it's only known by its nickname, the Hetzer. This name was originally designed for the future E-10 tank destroyer, but somehow it's been attributed to the Jagdpanzer 38T. The Hetzer was a pure tank hunter. It was a remarkably compact vehicle, with the armour of a Tiger, the gun of a Panzer IV, and the dimensions of a Panzer II. Due to its small size, it was easy to conceal and excelled in defensive operations. It was almost impossible to spot a camouflaged Hetzer in a tree line, and armed with a 75mm gun and remote-controlled machine gun, it was not a vehicle you could afford to miss. The Hetzer did suffer from the same weaknesses as most of the other casemate tank destroyers, poor gun traverse and thin side armour, but as it only entered service in July 1944, the war was very much a defensive one. Perhaps the biggest advantage the vehicle had was that it was cheap and easy to produce. Despite being the last Jagdpanzer to enter production, it was by far the most numerous, with over 2,800 vehicles finished before the end of the war. It was used post-war by the Swiss as the G13 and by the Czechs as the ST1. This was the last Jagdpanzer to be put into production before Germany surrendered in 1945. The Jagdpanzer IV and 38T were, in my opinion, very good vehicles and epitomised what Germany needed at that point in time. Smaller, better armoured stugs to fight a defensive war against incredibly unfavourable odds. The Jagdpanther and Jagdtiger, while impressively armed and armoured, were more of a hindrance than a help, slowing the production of the Panther and Tiger II for no real gain. The Ferdinand was a bit of a ridiculous vehicle, but was actually quite a good use of Tiger P hulls that would have otherwise, that would have otherwise been scrapped. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Comment below or join the Discord to get involved in this completely useless discussion. Anyway, despite my voice in this video, which is really starting to give up now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. 
and you should check out the Panzer Jaeger video if you haven't already. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see some more content, and I'll see you in the next one.